Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Officio Assassinorum mini-series, where today we're going to be having a look at the Calidus Temple, masters of long-term infiltration and the silent kill. A murder so subtle that on occasion, the target's closest affiliates, friends and family, never even notice. Impossible, you say? Oh no, no, no. For as we shall learn today, the Calidus are so much more than mere cutthroats. For not only are they experts at silencing a target, they are also capable of making the target sing an entirely different tune altogether. So how are these miracles performed, you may ask? Well, sit tight, and I will tell you all about the tactics, the weaponry, the deployment, and of course the specialized equipment that allows the Calidus to not only be one of the most efficient tools in the Officio Assassinorum's considerable kits, but also one of the most subtle. And we will, as usual, start at the very beginning. The operatives of the Caldus Temples are, as most Officio Assassinorum personnel, are recruited from the Scholar Progenium. But whereas the Vindicar Temple may recruit based on a good eye and a talent for marksmanship, and the Eversaw based on mental disturbances and a severe lack of anger management, the Caldus prefer actors, liars, individuals with a decidedly manipulative streak talents that will all serve them well indeed in their future careers. For just like with the Vindicar Temple, where finding the shot was so much more difficult than actually taking it, with the Calidus, assassinating the target is by far the easiest and the quickest part of their job. A Calidus assassin's training begins with lessons in impersonation. It is vital for their success that they can perfectly mimic anyone down to the most minute of details. Their voice, their appearance, their style of dress, their mannerisms and habits. A Calidus assassin must be able to become a perfect simulacrum of any person. That is, of course, a considerable undertaking, and a great deal of factors need to be taken into consideration. The easiest things to mimic is one's general behaviour, how one gesticulates, stands, walks and talks, what words are used where and how, and how one interacts with the environment, favouring one hand over the other for example, or preferring the heat over the cold, or vice versa. And another layer of that might be social interactions. Who are the target's friends? Who does he treat with respect? Who does he treat with derision? Who would he backtalk if given the opportunity? Who could they engage in friendly banter with? Who do they generally hate? Who do they pretend to like? And so on and so on and so on. But despite all the clear complexity, this is still the easiest part. For all these things are habits, mannerisms, general behaviour patterns. If given enough time to study someone, then copying these things is a competitively trivial matter. But you may have spotted the problem here. Given enough time to study. Well, that's all very good in theory, of course, but how do you study a planetary governor, surrounded at all times by countless security measures? Or the leader of a secret heretical cult? Hardly an overly public figure at the best of times, and hell, one of the security measures surrounding him may be the fact that you don't even know who is the leader of the cult. This is why Calidus assassins are trained for long-term infiltration. If you cannot get to the planetary governor immediately, then you start by replacing the cleaning lady. That gives you access to the kitchens, where you replace a chef. That gives you access to the serving staff. And from there you identify who it is that usually brings food to the guards, and perhaps even the primary security office. Whereupon you impersonate one of the guards, and so on and so on and so on. I'm sure you're starting to get the gist at this point, until you are next to the planetary governor for as many hours as possible in any given day. But obviously, this is not, uh, again, quite as straightforward as it sounds, because of course, 
every single person that the Calidus needs to impersonate will require its own period of study, of observation, of learning and mimicking. To varying degrees, of course, if you're replacing a cleaning lady who lives in the slums, for example, then her disappearance is unlikely to raise a great deal of eyebrows, nor is anyone higher up in the food chain likely to pay too much in the way of attention to her mannerisms and behaviour, but that too can be a dangerous assumption to make. For example, maybe this particular cleaning lady was in a relationship with one of the chefs. That will immediately complicate things quite considerably, especially if the Caldus assassin had failed to uncover this information before replacing the cleaning lady. Or even worse, what if the cleaning lady used to be the favoured officer's mattress of one of the security officers? That may rather quickly ring an alarm bell or two, but on the flip side, if our assassin has done her homework correctly, it might even provide the perfect in, allowing the Caldus to skip a great deal of intervening steps and gaining direct access to a high-ranking member of the security staff. But again, this all requires a great deal of time a great deal of observation, and an in-depth understanding of the human condition. The Caldus assassin must be able to read the most minute of hints in the facial features and the behavioural patterns and the habits of those around her. Uncovering the illicit relationship between a member of the cleaning staff and a security officer is of course one, if slightly extreme, example, but even if she were to just impersonate some random person, that random person has a life. He has friends, colleagues, enemies, all of which needs to be taken into account so as to perfectly impersonate whomever the Calidus is currently pretending to be. And of course, each individual step in this process introduces a new series of problems and complications. One of which is a body, in all due likelihood, and the sudden disappearance of a member of staff. Requiring yet further planning and preparation on behalf of the assassin. A accident, mayhaps, or a resignation would perhaps be easier, although if the person in question has been working for this employer for the last 30 years, a sudden resignation may seem suspicious, and so a plausible reason needs to be created. A death in the family, for example, and so you are required to go and look after your sick mother at which point you might actually have to produce a sick mother just in case your employers check. And so it goes. Yet further factors are added to factors, further complications created, and yet more problems require solving every step of the way. As you can clearly see, being a successful Calidus assassin requires a hell of a lot more than some acting skills and a clever disguise. And speaking of disguises, what happens if the cleaning lady is actually a man, and the security officer is actually a female, and the Caldus assassin needs to impersonate both? Well, that's where the clever disguise part comes in, but it isn't a disguise, it's a drug. And quite a potent one as well, as the majority of a Caldus assassin's training actually goes to learning how to control and tolerate the effects of the drug called polymorphine. As the non-too-subtle name suggests, it is a drug that allows the user to comprehensively change appearances. Everything from skin to hair to eyes to bone structure. It even allows for the redirection of nerve endings and musculature. For example, a common trick is to create a pouch of flesh that can be opened and closed at will by the assassin that does not contain overmuch in the way of nerve endings so as to prevent, well, pain and discomfort. And depending upon the individual operator's skill level and, well, imagination, the sky really is the limit as long as it is contained within the relatively baseline human form of the user. 
Polymorphine cannot create something from nothing. It can create intermediary solutions. For example, say that a lithe, muscular assassin wishes to become a fat, indulgent planetary governor. This is possible, but the body will first have to go through a minor change first. In the case of this example, the problem is fat. Now, of course, the human body always contains a certain percentile of fat, but nowhere near enough to turn a well-trained muscular assassin into an obese planetary governor. Of course, there are other ways around it. There are literal disguises, padding in other words, but if such things will not do, say, for example, a planetary governor is married, or has a habit of tumbling around with inappropriately aged housekeepers, well... <laughs> <laughs> then a pillow is no longer going to do, now is it? In these cases, the assassin can mess around with his own metabolism, allowing him to eat far more food than a regular human would, and store far more fat. Now this could in and of itself appear a hint suspicious, if the planetary governor's favourite bodyguard suddenly puts on a couple hundred pounds overnight. But the assassin can once again use the drug to allow him to fold the flabs of fat in upon themselves, or spread them out across his body, or even literally store the fat in special made containers within his body ready to be absorbed into the body at a moment's notice. Another example may be of an assassin that has been discovered, that is on the run after a successful assassination for example, and needs to change identity quickly. In these cases, going through a full-blown transformation may be too time-consuming, and so something simpler can be done instead, lowering one's cheekbones, changing eye colour, hair colour, or by changing the voice, from sounding like a female to a male or vice versa or maybe folding the flesh on one's face to appear old and wrinkled. And of course, there are mission-specific uses for the drug as well. We already talked about creating flesh pouches which could be used for smuggling weaponry. Or you could create a special cavity within the body that is kept at a certain temperature. Let's say, well below freezing, containing a vicious flesh-eating bacteria that just so happens to be inactive at that particular temperature. A bacteria that can then be vomited forth into somebody's dinner, perchance. Or a somewhat hilarious example, that of a Calidus assassin who was sent to find blackmail material on a planetary governor. She discovered that he was very, very fond of his child. And so she snuck into the child's bedroom, swallowed it whole, and carried the child, still perfectly alive and comfortable, out of the palace inside of her own belly. <laughs> Innovative, most definitively. But what if a Caldus assassin is required to infiltrate non-human society? What if an assassin is required to pose as a Tau, or an Orc, or an Eldar, or any other manner of creature? Well, then things get a little bit more complicated. Whilst polymorphine is quite versatile, to be sure, it does have its limits. In the case of an orc, for example, there really is no way for a human to put on that kind of musculature, that kind of bulk, without some pretty extensive rewriting of one's biology. But that does not mean that it is impossible. Through augmentative surgeries and an extensive, rigorous application of polymorphine treatments, pretty much any creature can be impersonated, some with considerable more ease than others. Impersonating a Tau, for example, is relatively simple. Most of the work can be done via the polymorphine, and only some minor surgical work is required. As for impersonating an orc, well, the problem itself is relatively straightforward. Muscle mass. A far from unassailable problem, but requires considerably more work than a towel. And perhaps one of the most difficult transformations to undergo would be Calidus to Eldar. 
At first, the transformation may seem quite straightforward. Eldar are outwardly similar to human beings, a bit taller, a bit thinner perhaps, but that in and of itself should not be particularly problematic to replicate, but that is merely the outward appearance. The true alien nature of the Eldar only becomes apparent when they are in motion. They flow with an elegance and grace that is quite beyond even the most talented of ballerinas. This is because their fine motor skills are far more honed than any human, their nerve endings far more acute, their musculature far more developed. They are, quite simply, quite a bit more of an advanced species than us poor Monkeg barbarians. And even if all of this can eventually be replicated through enough care and effort, well, sadly, being the pretentious knife-eared twats that they are, the Eldar also communicate in a fashion that is seemingly completely and utterly incomprehensible to most humans. There are inquisitors and members of the Imperial Diplomatic Corps that have, for a very, 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 very long time indeed, attempted to establish meaningful diplomatic relations with the Eldar, and in some cases they have, to a degree, succeeded in these efforts. But even the most skilled inquisitor and diplomats, even those who have spent decades and on occasion centuries speaking to and communicating with the Eldar, they have only established the most rudimentary and basic understanding of Eldar communication. Indeed, the Eldar are essentially speaking baby to them, as we may speak to a dog or well, a literal baby, they speak to us. Whereas Eldar to Eldar may communicate subtle meanings, intentions and references through gestures, hand movements, uh, facial expressions, or hell, subtle changes in their body odour or stance, etc. We humans can hardly perceive a fraction of all of this, and so for a Calidus assassin to infiltrate Eldar society, well, it better be an exceptionally skilled Calidus assassin. Not impossible, but probably not something you want to be doing for the long term. And of course, with as considerable a transformation as this would be, it would not even be enough to merely be a skilled Caldus assassin, one must also possess the correct level of tolerance for the polymorphine drug. And that factor can vary quite considerably. One of the biggest differences is that polymorphine functions far, far more efficiently and less lethally on female humans rather than males. There are male Calidus assassins, contrary to popular belief, but they are very, very, very rare. And even those occasional male assassins that can utilize polymorphine, they will have to do so with a great deal more effort and pain, and still probably only be able to produce half the result of a female operative. But polymorphine is of course not the only tool in the Caldus Assassin's arsenal, so let's have a look at some of the other pieces of equipment as well. Now, in the case of deep, long-term infiltration, it is not always possible to bring weaponry along with the Assassin. In these cases, the Caldus has been trained with virtually every conceivable form of weaponry available in the Imperium, and a fair few that are not, alongside of course with the ability to turn pretty much any everyday household object into a weapon in its own right. A fork, for example, may not cause overmuch in the way of harm if punched into a guy's sternum, but when inserted in his eyes and then hammered through the eye socket into the brain, well, that is a hint more lethal. But assuming the assassin in question has either had time or the luxury of opportunity with which to bring along her own weaponry and war gear, then they will use several pieces of specialised equipment, the most unique of them all undoubtedly being the Catan Phase Sword. Yes, the Catan, as in the Necron semi-deities. 
The exact origin of these weapons are, uh, not exactly well known, shall we say. The prevailing theory is that they were discovered in various Necron ruins, presumably by the Adaptus Mechanicus, who were poking their noses where they did not belong for the umpteenth time. After which, uh, the higher powers within the Imperium somehow managed to wrest this technology away from the Adeptus Mechanicus, which in and of itself would be quite the fucking achievement, and is now utilising them for their own purposes. And a Catan Phaseblade is most certainly an extraordinarily effective weapon for somebody expected to be in close quarters contact with one's target, because the peculiar composition of the blade along with completely and utterly not understood in the slightest Necron technology allows it to slice clean through, well, Literally anything. Armor, flesh, bones, weaponry, shielding, anything. Or, well, almost anything, because there is one exception, namely the body of a Catan, who will simply just absorb the metal straight back into its own body. Which has happened on at least one occasion, where a particularly unlucky Imperial assassin attempted to kill an Imperial planetary governor, who turned out to be an aspect of the Catan known as the Deceiver. That must have been a particularly awkward moment for the assassin, no doubt. And to add further misery to the situation, the rest of the assassin's arsenal would probably also not have been overly effective against that kind of target. But against most things, the Calidus is asked to dispose of an arsenal of poisoned blades will probably work quite well. Poisoned weaponry in general is something that the Caldus Temple is quite fond of, because it can turn even the most humble looking instrument into a deadly weapon. Which is pretty damn important if you're trying to infiltrate somewhere where you're not supposed to be carrying anything obviously lethal. A humble sewing needle, for example, dipped in the right concoction can be quite the dangerous weapon, or a small knife. An opponent may underestimate just a little blade, especially if he himself is armed with something a bit meatier, until a single slight cut on a forearm turns the entire arm into a fascinating shade of purple. And of course, with envenomed weaponry, you don't necessarily need to cut or stab someone with it either. A throwing weapon could work just as well. A poisonous shuriken that, for reasons of comedic effect, has been stored somewhere near the bumhole of the assassin in question that has been stewing in a particularly terrifying concoction of most disgusting poisonous virulence for god only knows how many days before finally being launched towards the unsuspecting head of some cult leader. And if a bit more in the way of crowd control is required, then the Caldus Assassin possesses a third and final weapon, the Neural Shredder. This, much like the Catan Faceblade, is a weapon that nobody really quite necessarily knows how works, but it does work. And so, nobody really asks any questions. When fired, the weapon sends out a pulse of energy that interferes with the nervous system of any living creature in front of it. This energy pulse is fairly large and can affect multiple living beings simultaneously, and it will cause their nerve endings to fire randomly, intermittently, and on occasions cease functioning entirely. Best case scenario, for the target that is, he will be temporarily stunned, as his body will enter into a period of constant spasms. Worst case scenario, something vital will stop working, like heart, or brain, or lungs, or these things. You know, things you kind of need to stay alive. The downside, of course, is that uh, the effects can be a hint unpredictable, although still pretty much universally negative as far as the target is concerned. The benefit is that it will work just about equally well on any target. Even a massive hulking space marine will be brought down by this weapon, at least for a time. And it will also remain effective against servitors, who use a great deal of the body's nervous system to carry out various functions but it will of course in turn have absolutely zero effects on anything mechanical, 
Luckily, there are relatively few mechanical racers in the 41st millennium. Although the one that is around is, uh, basically the absolute worst nightmare of any Caldus assassin. Luckily, they are rarely sent to infiltrate Necron tomb worlds because, well, even polymorphine has its limits. And on the note of infiltration again, there is also the Caladus Assassin's rather distinct synth-skin body glove. The rather fetishistic appearance has its origins in very, very, very old lore. And that is all I'm going to be saying about that, because it was a disturbing part of old lore that, alongside other things, included mentions of Tyranid reproductive cavities. So, let us just move swiftly on past that particular point. The main idea behind the Sinskin body glove is that it is able to fit to any form that the assassin chooses to adopt, it being extraordinarily malleable. Additionally, it also contains a wide array of sensor-baffling equipment, much like the spy suit of the Vindicar assassin, for those occasions where the Kaladas has to infiltrate the last bit of the way to a target, or where the time for observation has simply come and gone, and it is time for immediate action. Some Caldus assassins also utilize a bit of an eccentric piece of uh, war gear? I guess you could term it as such. The so-called Death Card. This, as the name implies, looks like a normal playing card, except it is equipped with a holographic capture device and a projector. It will capture the last moment of the target's life and then project that moment out in a holograph for everyone to see, along with a recording of the target's death screams, played on a constant loop. As you can probably already tell, this is hardly the most subtle calling card in the Imperium, and is used only when a clear and precise example needs to be set against the Emperor's enemies. But... What it lacks in subtlety, it does make up for in effectiveness. As you can probably well imagine, seeing the last horrified moment of your rebellious leader played out in front of you on a hololithic projection whilst his screams are still bouncing off the walls can make anyone think twice about their future within the rebellion. And speaking of targets, for once again, what is an assassin without someone to assassinate? On the last part of the video, we will be talking about what kind of people may expect a brief but intimate acquaintance with a Calidus assassin. Well, one of the most common targets are those that the Imperium are not quite sure yet whether they are targets or whether the target even exists at all. Which might sound a little counterproductive, but in the case of heretical cults, for example, the leader of the cult is usually not immediately apparent. As, well, making yourself an apparent leader of a heretical cult is usually a rather quick way of ending your life in the Imperium of Man. And it can be very difficult to discern precisely who is the leader of these shadow secretive organizations. And if you move too swiftly with overwhelming force by sending in the Arbites or local law enforcement or even Imperial Guard elements, then there is every chance that the true leader of the rebellion may slip away. He may, for example, have infiltrated high up in Imperial governance and be warned of any such local moves against him. But it is very unlikely that he will have contacts high enough up to know what the High Lords are doing, or the Officio for that matter. And a Caldus assassin can infiltrate from the lowest level of the cult, becoming an initiate, and then working her way slowly, ever so slowly up the ranks, through subterfuge and seemingly genuine adherence to the cult's own beliefs. These kinds of infiltrations are usually amongst the absolute longest that a Caladus assassin is asked to undertake, and only the most fervently loyal are chosen for these kinds of tasks, due to the sheer amount of time required. 
Having to submerge yourself in the raw gunk of chaos for a few years can affect the psyche of even the most steadfast individuals after all. And since most cult leaders are, as mentioned, somewhat cautious individuals, it will probably take quite some time for even the most skilled individual to flatter one's way up the ranks to get close enough to positively identify the leader, after which the leader and probably the entire inner circle will be taken off the playing board, probably in a rather public and visceral manner as well, usually involving a calling card just to make sure that anybody else who thought, hey, promotion, will reconsider. Another favourite target may be those who are clearly working against the Imperium's better interests, but are not doing so in an obvious or overt fashion. Say, for example, an Imperial planetary governor that has decided to refuse the Adeptus Mechanicus the rights to gather various pieces of fascinating bibbidi boops from a nearby space hulk who just so happens to have entered orbit around the governor's own planet. This is technically something that a planetary governor may have power to do, but also something that the Imperium at large probably would frown at. And if various diplomatic overtures, e.g. bribes, fail, then perhaps the Imperium must find some other way to motivate a spirit of change in the heart of this intransigent Imperial bureaucrat. And this does not necessarily mean termination, it could be <laughs> blackmail. Which, you know, everything considered, is still better than just flat out murder, is it not? But should he still remain intransigent or even possibly have nothing with which he can be blackmailed, then murder may be a wonderful option, and he shall simply just have to be replaced with the Calidus assassin instead. And suddenly you will see that the uh, governance of that particular planet will become far more cooperative. Another way to do this that is slightly less extreme is for the Caldus assassin to infiltrate the closest advisory circle of the target, and from that position, start giving advice that is far more aligned with the Imperium's own interests, whilst also making sure that any other advisor who is too blind to see the greater good also realises that yes, yes, perhaps this argument has a great deal of merit after all. Like, for example, the merit of not revealing to everyone that the advisor in question has some dubious sexual preferences. And this can of course also be extended to enemies outside of the Imperium. Chaos Lords, Rebel Leaders, or even Alien Warlords. All of them can potentially be infiltrated and replaced, or simply steered in a more correct direction. After all, it is occasionally to the Imperium's benefit if its enemies focus more on internal squabbles than uh, upon the Imperium. And the deployment of a single Calidus assassin, assuming it can get close enough to the leader in question to divert entire armies, well, then that is one very, very efficient Imperial servant. And of course, perhaps the most valuable asset of any of this is that if the Caldas assassin does her job correctly, and is instructed to not leave behind a screaming holographic calling card, then no one will ever know who carried out the assassination. Or, potentially, no one will even know that there ever was an assassination in the first place which is particularly vital in the case of certain Imperial officials who are not technically breaking any laws or any rules, but are still clearly in opposition to the greater Imperial good, as seen by, well, two-thirds of the High Lords of Terror. And if such an individual should suddenly and unexpectedly catch a high-powered sniper rifle round to the head, then awkward questions may be raised, 
much better if he simply changes his tone all on his very own. Or, at the very least, apparently, all on his very own. And on that comforting note, I will wrap up this video safe in the knowledge that the greater good of the Imperium will always prevail, in one way or another. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and please do comment, like, and share the video around, because those are the only things that YouTube care about these days. Until next time, have a good day.